Hello and welcome to the High Altitude Adventures podcast. This is episode four. My name is Mikhail and I'm your space travel agent. Two years ago, I suddenly learned about several projects and I realized I had no idea about their existence. And I thought I knew everything about space and aviation. I was wrong. And I'm sure most of you are still not aware of these projects. And we will fill this gap today because our guest today is Jose Mariana Lopez Ordialis. He is the founder and CEO at Zero to Infinity Company, a company which will be sending people to the edge of space in space rated capsules carried by stratospheric balloons. Hello, Jose. Thank you for joining us today. Hi, Mikhail and all the audience. Good to be here. Jose, I know that um, you were involved with balloons for all, many, many years. So you're probably one of the best experts to discuss this topic. Let's talk in general about these stratospheric projects. Uh, your company is one of several companies which are planning to launch mm -hmm. these uh, space tours to stratosphere. So what we're talking about, what is that? Yeah, so we're talking about seeing the Earth blue with a curved horizon and the sky black during the day. These are the visual features that most people associate with space, and we intend to provide those instead of flying up there with the rocket, flying up where you can see those with a balloon. That's basically the, the idea in a nutshell. And balloon is something big, huge. How big is this balloon? And, and we're talking about capsules uh, where two, three, four, five, six, eight people, depending on what the project fit, weighing several tons. So how big is the balloon? So the, the balloon itself uh, changes size quite a bit. When you take off, it has a few meters of diameter. But when it reaches a maximum altitude, it can be up to 100 or even 120 meters of diameter, which is hard to imagine. It's very, very large. And the capsule underneath, the, what we call the pod where people are, it's pressurized so they can have a shirt leaf environment. They can be with normal clothes and, and has uh, a smaller volume, of course, than the balloon. And it's like a, like a cabin, like an aircraft, like a small aircraft cabin, just with wider windows so you can enjoy the view better. So size-wise, it's like a football field. I hear this uh, quite often. <laughs> That, that's a good comparison, yes. So you're inside the capsule. It's a pressurized capsule. Uh, there are, um, how many people in your project would be inside that capsule? Pilots and passengers? Our so design uh, includes two seats for pilots and four seats for passengers. So six people inside, sitting in some comfortable chairs. Uh, the capsule will have windows looking outside. This whole thing is attached to the football field size balloon once it reaches the atmosphere. And that's how it looks. Mm -hmm. that, that, that's right. Yes. And how heavy is the capsule in, in your current design estimations? So the, the capsule fully loaded is about, just above two, two and a half uh, tons. Okay. okay. So it's a, a, like a large car. In terms of in terms of weight, and um, and the the balloon itself also weighs uh, uh, a couple of a couple of tons, if you can believe it. But it's just very very thin film. Okay, now physics <laughs> of this whole thing. So a balloon, and some projects use helium. Some projects are planning to use hydrogen. Uh, your company is planning to use helium, I believe, right? Exactly. We the the whole thing floats because. Uh, the ensemble, the, the combination of the balloon and the flight train, which is what's between the balloon and the gondola or the capsule and, and the capsule and the air inside the capsule, the whole thing with the, with the lifting gas is less dense than the air where we, where we live. And then it goes up, up to a point where it's more or less similar density as the outside air. And that way you can design missions to go to different altitudes. We, our plan is to go to 36 kilometers altitude, uh, which we think it's sort of a sweet spot for what we're trying to do. Basically, going any higher will not make the sky get any blacker. 
once the sky is black and the earth is blue below, separating yourself from the planet further doesn't change that fact. It's as black as it gets. Okay. So going back to the physics, so it's, uh, if someone wants to Google the physics, it's buoyancy, I assume. So uh, something exactly. is, is buoyant uh, and it, similar to how it happens in liquid in the sea, like in the, in the Dead Sea in Israel, uh, you're floating almost at the surface because the, the water is denser. In the, yes. in the river, you almost sink or in a swimming pool. And now we switch back to air. Well, our air density is such that helium or hydrogen is a less dense gas uh, will float up. Uh, for as long as you said, as it reaches its equilibrium at certain altitudes, for we, which right. you program it. Okay, so That's this right. is this is it on the physics. We will not discuss physics anymore. We'll now discuss the, the oh. fun facts. So now let's go back to the whole flight profile. Let, let's explain to our listeners and viewers what is that in the whole flight profile sequence from the moment you come to that airfield or whatever location you're launching it from, what happens and how long each stage lasts and what, how, what's the sequence of the events? So, I mean, we have to understand that the, the, the whole thing starts when you sign up with someone like you, with, you, with the travel designer that is going to help uh, provide a custom experience for, for customers because we really want these flights to be unique for, for different people because it's, it's not something you do every day. So, but then you, you would come a couple of days before the flight. We make sure that you are well fed, that you don't have jet lag, that you are well rested, because this is going to be an intense experience. This is something that we want you to enjoy at your prime, enjoy in the best optimal, most, most optimal conditions possible. So once, once you've, you spent a couple of days uh, also familiarizing yourself with the the safety mechanisms, the safety system, the, what's going to happen to the pod, what are the different uh, things that could happen, how do you have to behave in those situations so you, you understand well how to move, move on uh, in, any, in any situation. Then uh, you take off very early in the morning, just before dawn, and um, the ascent takes a couple of hours, two or two and a half hours, uh, you will see the sun rising and uh, it will be spectacular because the sun will rise and the sky will stay black even after the sun rises, uh, which is something that uh, very, very few humans have experienced so far. And we want to change that. And then you stay at float altitude for two and a half, maybe three hours, depending on the winds, because you are actually following the winds. Uh, there is no propulsion on board, no engines on board. We don't need them. You're basically following the wind patterns and they typically take you a couple of hundred kilometers away. So uh, some, so that then once you get to the landing area, which has been predefined in advance, okay, it's not a surprise. Those winds are not random. Those winds have been studied at, in great detail so that there are people waiting for you at the end point because you do not land on the original launch point. That's the same the typical case with any kind of balloon. So um, then, then you descend partly with a balloon attached, venting some helium, and then at some point you separate from the balloon and you open a large parafoil, uh, which can make the capsule land on a specific area and of course can avoid any, anything that needs avoiding uh, on your way down and um, and also it can perform a small flare maneuver so that the actual touchdown is more comfortable than using conventional conical parachutes or a cluster of, com of conical parachutes like, like other systems out there. Really, the way to come back from extreme altitudes so far is, is as I say, textile-based decelerators or parachutes of many types. They could be a cluster, they could be a single one, they could be guided, they could be, but that's the way. Uh, we don't have uh, any, we as humans don't have a good track record of landing uh, on Earth or on the sea coming from very high altitudes uh, using any other way, okay? Uh, when you look at the shuttle or other systems like that, the track record is not, not, not spectacular. So, uh, of course, one day uh, when you look at science fiction or even the space tourism industry develops, we may have capsules that land uh, with little retro rockets or fancy things like that. 
that would be very cool, but we're not there yet. And we are only interested in things that are super, super proven and super, super safe for our customers. Yeah, I can immediately plug my skydiving experience. Yes, uh, I landed 1,100 times with this, exactly the same approach. And before that, yeah. I landed 40 times on round canopies. Ooh, round canopies are not good. <laughs> yeah. And square, square canopies allow a nice and smooth touchdown if you do it correctly. Exactly. So on, on the way down, as you said, you will know pretty much exactly or very accurately the wind patterns so you will be able to predict where this uh, uh, system will be descending into and then with the help of the parafoil you will, you can pinpoint the land into exact location where you want it to be exactly that's that's how it works okay yes. and, on the, and all these parts have been tested okay already uh, yeah, this is very important. I will come back uh, to that later. But on the way up, I want to emphasize it's smooth, it's quiet, no weightlessness, no G-forces, it's slow, easy. I, I, I like to use the word posh for, for this part of a space travel experience. Nice and easy for a for couple of hours on the way up and then gently floating for a couple of hours there, enjoying the view. That's the That's experience right. we're That's selling. Right. If, if what you want is to say that you've survived Mach 4, Mach 5, and 6Gs on your body, we are not the best supplier for that. There's a market out there that can provide that. But if what you want is to enjoy with your loved ones this view and really see it for long enough to remember it, like watching a movie, not the trailer for the movie, then uh, this, this is the way. And um, you mentioned you launched uh, payloads to uh, stratospheric altitudes with a similar type balloons, maybe smaller size, many, many times to similar altitudes. So which means you saw, well, through the eyes of your equipment, which was there, exactly what these passengers will see. And you mentioned that before. So curvature of the earth, visible, thin blue atmospheric level below you. I read that 99% of atmosphere is below you. Uh, dark uh, sky, and you will actually see stars, will you? Because I, I heard conflicting stories about that. Will you or it, will you not see the stars? It, okay, it's not easy, but you need to get your eye used to darkness. So if your eye has glare from the earth or the sun, you won't be able to see the stars because the, the, the eye will close. But if you get your eyes used to the darkness, which is possible because you have plenty of time, and then you just look on a window that is opposite from the sun and not looking at the earth, then you'll be, you should be able to see them uh, up to maybe magnitude uh, one or something like that. I mean, you will be able to see a, a few planets and a few stars. Not a full sky, but you will see a lot of stars, of course, just before dawn as you're going up. And the sun color will be white, not yellow, I assume, because it's yellow because That's of right. atmospheric refraction or whatever it's called. Exactly, the, 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 the sun is white, and then but the blue light gets spread all over the earth, and that's why the earth looks blue, and the sky looks blue, but the, and the yellow light goes straight. And here we are above where this happens, we're above the scattering, so we, we get directly the, the blinding white, white hot of, of the sun, yes. So, well, we can um, always argue with smart people on technicalities, the border of space, 100 kilometers, 80 kilometers, uh, 400 kilometers of the International Space Station is flying. But we can totally call this trip a space flight because the capsule is space rated. It's rated for full vacuum. You are above most of the atmosphere. If you open the door, yeah. it's as much fun as if you open the door on the International Space Station because there's nothing there. Uh, right. pure, pure vacuum. So that's why we call it space travel and people who like to read books and say no 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 carmen line no it's not space okay fine no this is space travel this is pure and nice space travel yeah i mean everybody probably a lot of listeners remember when red bull had this wonderful project where they flew up a capsule with a skydiver and he beat a bunch of records uh, and he had, of course, a space suit to go outside because you really need it the same as if you were in lowered orbit. And, uh, and this guy, everybody recognized his job as a space dive. He, when he goes to any dinner or everything, they talk to people, talk to him like they would talk to an astronaut because he's had a similar visual and experience, even in, you could argue in some cases more extreme. So, um, 
yeah, the, the customer is always right, you know. And if the customer wants to cross the carbon line and that's all he cares about, well, I'm sure there's a market of vehicles. They may not even have windows eventually because if you just want to cross the carbon line, go up there and you cross and here's your diploma, you cross the carbon line. Some customers, the vast majority of the customers that I speak to have never heard of the Carmen line and they couldn't even care less, but they just say, I want a picture like that. I, I see that and I want to be there. I want to go where you're showing me. And I don't care if it's miles, kilometers, whatever. I just want to go there and see my planet blue and round and beautiful. That's well, that, and a comment for my future sales speech, never mention Carmen Line. You will distract a lot of people <laughs> <laughs> from the balloon projects. Now, uh, you, your, your uh, instruments, whatever you sent in the past, they took pictures of Earth. And is it as beautiful as we always saw it on the space pictures? Blue, green, nice? How very, does it look? Very similar. It's very similar. Of course, uh, from ISS, you're, you're about... 10 times, 12 times higher. So you have a higher, uh, a wider field of view, but but you can, from these altitudes, you still see hundreds of, the altitudes we fly, we see hundreds of kilometers in every direction. You recognize the shapes of countries, you recognize rivers and, and uh, mountain ranges and deserts and forests and cities, they look small. And uh, we, we overflew once uh, the city of uh, Lleida near Barcelona, and put together a map of all the little streets. Uh, um, the, so I actually, I believe that high altitude balloons can offer a lot of services, not just space tourism, of course. They can solve uh, some of the problems that we are experiencing, such as, hey, early warning of fires or monitoring environmental pollution or even weather forecast. Um, We've been launching weather balloons, just measuring a few parameters, but that's before we invented digital cameras. Now we could fly uh, weather balloons that actually took pictures of the clouds and, and took uh, imagery of what's going on. In many ways, it's complementary to satellites. And uh, and uh, yeah, I, I'm, I have to say I'm thankful to, to China for flying their spy balloon for the U.S. because they they've made all this a lot more tangible for for people just reading the news. Now I'm sure all these uh, projects which are planning to launch uh, these space tours they paid Chinese to for this PR campaign to launch this Chinese spy balloon. So the people that's right. That. <laughs> uh, and where where will you be launching from? Uh, Spain, I assume. Spain is really good for tourism. And not and space tourism is not an exception. I mean, some of the same features that you want for a tourism place, like okay, I want sun, I don't want too much cloud cover, I want predictable weather, and these kinds of things. Those features Spain has them, and for that reason, there is also all the hospitality sector, the ground sector, like hotels, villas they can rent, uh, high-end healthcare, all anything that the typical space tourist may want. They have it here. It's not quite the same in other locations around the world where they, they are like, okay, we're going to promote uh, space tourism, let's say, in, in New Mexico, and that will improve the economy of New Mexico because we don't have a lot of wealthy people coming here anyway. Well, that's an approach. is to build it and they will come. You build it and you hope that they will come and have an, an impact, and, and probably there is some effect. We are of the opposite view. We say, okay, we want our business to work. So we want to be somewhere where we already know that enough people that can afford it come uh, all the time. So the south of Spain is, is quite optimal in that sense, and we, that's where we've done most of our test flights. And uh, we expect this to grow, but we see there is uh, room for several stratoports, if you will, uh, around the world, because there's uh, there are wonderful things to see from, from different places around the world, and the market is, is big enough for, for several of this. So, but uh, launch, if launching from south uh, of Spain, you will see Mediterranean, of course, Spain. Will you see Africa? Oh, it yes, too far. Okay. absolutely. You would see, let me make a short list. You see uh, the deserts of Almeria, you see the highest mountains in the Iberian Peninsula, Sierra Nevada, you see Africa, you see the Atlas in, in Africa, you see the Atlantic, the Mediterranean, the Strait of Gibraltar, Portugal, the marshes of Doñana, the National Park, um, forests of Cazorla. So it's a lot of astronauts 
I've heard them say that when they're overflying the Strait of Gibraltar and that southern Spain area, it's a little bit like seeing the whole world in one glimpse because you get places that are that have ice all year and you see deserts and you see forests and you see seas and rivers and all sorts of kind of landscapes. And, uh, and that's, uh, that's a really good thing because if you're saying just the same kind of landscape and no sea, no water, just let's say a desert, it's not as appealing. It's not as appealing for, for, such, a, for such an experience. We have to take all those things into consideration. And as I said, a lot of people from Ireland get used to traveling to Spain. Uh, when our rains uh, switch from warm to cold in winter, we like to go to Barcelona and places like that. Uh, now, three most important questions. How much does it cost? When are you planning to launch? And what are the limitations, uh, requirements, training requirements, age limits for this particular project? So initially... We will be flying people that are older than 18, but we completely foresee uh, the lowering this age to 16, 14. We've already discussed this with uh, officials at EASA, the European Agency for the Safety of Aviation, and they don't see why, why you wouldn't be able to do that. The bookings so far have been done at 110,000 euro. It's not like we have lots of them. We have a few, but we don't spend any money in marketing, which limits that and we believe the best marketing actually will happen when we actually fly people that's when people will take us seriously and, and sign there's a lot of people waiting by then probably the price will go up <laughs> because because when you have an increase in demand but the, the same kind of supply or the supply cannot grow as fast that's how market dynamics work and you get an increase on in, in price, eventually we want to make this much more affordable. Okay, we have a full roadmap on how to make this a lower cost, but you got to start somewhere. Okay, and since we're initially competing with experiences that are in the tens of tens of millions of euros, uh, anything in this ballpark is 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 an improvement. And um, and when we'll be able to fly the first humans? Well, to be honest, it, it's really a matter of getting the right funding in place. And so far we have 40 investors, we have a few VCs, um, some very smart people, McKinsey executives, Airbus executives, PayPal executives. However, we haven't had the critical mass to safely take a person up there. And we will not do it unless we have the critical mass in team and, and resources. So. It's taken us about 13 years to get to this point. It may take us one and a half year or two years to start flying tourists, or it may take us another 13 years. It really depends on our ability uh, to fundraise. And uh, there are other projects that have been more successful at fund fundraising, but they may not have been so successful at actually flight testing things. I mean, we've flown several pressurized pods. The largest one was 50% of the size of the, of the vehicle that we will need. So you, you really need someone, could be us, could be someone else, where, where the combination of the right level of funding and the right level of uh, technical expertise and execution uh, are, are together. Uh, right now, I don't, get quite, I don't quite yet see it in the, in the market. So we may have to wait. Um, but uh, I'm, I'm optimistic that this will become more and more obvious. Well, but uh, you have flown prototype, you said 50% yes. prototype. Right. You, you have flown instrumental payloads many times. Many companies in the world have flown instrumental payloads. Several companies are planning to launch these operations next year. A couple of companies, maybe a year later. There's one small Japanese company which claimed they will launch this year. I doubt that. But we'll see. Yeah. Maybe, maybe Chinese will launch a couple of more spy balloons and people say, hey, yeah, this works. And maybe passenger tours will work too. And uh, once this ball will start rolling in one country, another country, country, I assume people will get interested. And when they understand the price range, which is, as I said, much more favorable than millions of dollars um, for the true space flight, then they will become more interested. And I'm sure investors will so. become interested too. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, look, a uh, couple of questions on the safety side, because safety is sure. my priority. And uh, I just want well, to make it absolutely clear. Yeah. <laughs> so you said um, you go down uh, first using the balloon, then you switch to a, a parafoil, a parachute. So if something goes wrong during either part of the, of the flight, uh, on the way up, on the way there, on the way down, what are the safety measures? What are the redundancies? 
Yeah, so besides the guided parafoil, the, the rectangular one, we have a ballistic recovery system, a, 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 a little rocket that pulls out uh, a conventional parachute, which can be activated anytime with even very close to the ground. And, and it's very similar to what's carried on the Cirrus airplanes. Um, so there is a dissimilar redundancy on the parachute, if you will. So there are two different solutions for that. Um, if you need to cut short the flight, let's say somebody gets a heart attack during the flight or something like this, uh, we can uh, bring down the capsule uh, fast by separating from the balloon. It will not get supersonic on the way down. That's why we don't want to go up about 36 kilometers. But it comes down and then, and then we open the, um, the parachute and land and every flight will have uh, a map and, and we've already do this on our on crewed flights uh, of where are the landing areas if we had to stop the flight along the way, where is the optimal uh, landing area so that we don't do any damage to third parties and also that the, the flight is, is the more, is, is better for, for the payload. Uh, we also have systems to pump air inside the cabin. We carry extra air in case there was a leak or something of that sort um, to repressurize uh, the cabin, um, which is a, an unusual failure mode, but it's better to look at everything. And the, 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 first, the very, very first flights, uh, uh, the, the pilots will wear and, and the professionals that will fly, because we also intend to fly professionals, you know, like astronauts in training, uh, people that are sent by their governments or their companies uh, to do something specific up there. Uh, they, will, they, they will wear spacesuits in those very, very first flights. But once we get used to that, um, they won't have to do it. It's similar to on a, when you design a new kind of car and they're testing it on a circuit. The people that go in that car, they have full protective gear. They have no mech suits and helmets and things because it's the, it's, it's the first time that they, this is done. But then, of course, then you just go inside a car like a normal car once you get certified for commercial use. And the same will happen when we do our first flight. So when people see uh, people in astronaut suits on the first flights, it's not that won't be forever. That's just a, a, an extra measure that you need when you are doing something experimentally for the first time. Now, in terms of redundancy, I, I understand there will be pilots on board, but uh, will you have also a backup link so that the flight can be controlled from the ground in case of some emergency on the board? Uh, yes, absolutely. The, the craft can be controlled by the pilots from the ground and can also be put in safe autonomous mode if needed. Um, we believe that the pilots are there not just for safety, but also to provide a better experience to the customer because they can be like a mediator with the experience. They are someone that has been there before that understands really well what's going on and can point out things that just going on your own uh, one, might, one might miss. Uh, now, the last uh, set of questions, actually, one big question. Uh, I want people to understand that this is not a rich people toy. This is not an abnormal activity. Uh, hot air balloons, uh, high altitude, stratospheric balloons are here since 1783 when they started, 1901 when the first hydrogen balloons went up, uh, 1920s first helium balloons went up, and uh, uh, all these record flights in 1930s, 1950s when we crossed 20 kilometers lines, 30 kilometers line, 2014, 40 kilometers line when Alan Eustace, uh, from former Google SVP, right. made his historic flight up and then skydive down. And um, uh, this, uh, uh, balloons are used extensively and have been used all the century for the centuries. Weather balloons, observation and surveillance, uh, and uh, Chinese advertise this significantly. But uh, police, def uh, de Department of Defense of many countries are using them. Uh, there are plans to use uh, high altitude balloons for for cells, uh, cellular communication, internet. Uh, they can be kind of low flying satellites equivalents. And um, I also know that your company has a particular project which you are considering to launch satellites using uh, high altitude balloons. Uh, can you talk mm -hmm. briefly about that? What's so specific about launching satellites from uh, with the, using the stratospheric balloons? 
Exactly. Yeah. Um, you see, uh, in the last few years, we because of the miniaturization of electronics, we've been able to put a lot of power on very small masses. So there's been a growing demand for microsatellite launchers. Most of them look like missiles, either ground-based missiles or aircraft launch missiles. So they were all long and skinny. So what I asked myself was, okay, how high would I need to be so that the missile doesn't look have to look thin and slender and can look like anything and it just has the optimal shape and the fairing where the payload, the satellite is, is wider, etc. And you end up, if you run the numbers, you end up fig figuring out that at 25 kilometers, if one can get to 25 kilometers without flying very fast, then there's a significant benefit in, in, in making that rocket that is designed to start from there. The rocket has fewer parts, it's easier to reuse, it has, of course, a significantly smaller environmental footprint than anything launched from an airplane or from the ground, and that's, that's what we call Project Blue Star. Uh, it was initially supported by the European Space Agency, uh, we've also had some support from the Algerian Space Agency. The project uh, has a different level of requirements of funds. It's, it's actually more expensive to develop a satellite launcher than to develop a capsule to take humans on high altitude balloons. But I believe it would respond to a demand in the market right now uh, of dedicated small satellite uh, launch which so far is uh, there aren't many companies doing this uh, very successfully. So you're basically, you don't need a shroud. You can uh, pre-open solar panels. Uh, the max Q, the atmospheric pressure is not there. So there are multiple advantages. Right. It's, not, it's not so much you save on altitude or speed because you still have to no. accelerate the same uh, pain. Correct. But, uh, but you still a lot have of advantages. People, exactly. A lot of people have dismissed historically launching from high altitude balloon satellites because they are focused exclusively on the energy levels or the delta V that you need. And of course, there is a negligible change in this. But that's not the question. The question is the euros or the dollars that it costs you to do this. And if your rocket it has 10 times fewer parts, that's a lot of engineering hours that are needed, that are saved uh, compared to a rocket that launches from the ground. If you don't need a Cape Canaveral or a Kourou base, you're just launching a, a balloon that you can actually launch from any kind of from any boat in the sea, uh, you put the balloon, uh, you inflate the balloon, uh, moving the boat at the same speed as the wind on the ground, and that's that just works. And then you lift uh, your heavy payload up to 25 kilometers. So you can save on the ground infrastructure, on the rocket them itself, because it's easier to make. It's also a lot easier to reuse, because the the shapes that is are good for reusing and coming back down are really bad for coming back up. You know, if you're coming back down, you want to be like a parachute. If you're going up, you want to be like a needle. These are the opposite shapes. But if the going up is done by the balloon, and then you, you come back down already with the right kind of thick uh, fat or, you know, hollow uh, shape, then the re reusability is, is piece of cake compared to reusing needles. And we've managed to reuse uh, missile things. I mean, when you look at SpaceX or Blue Origin, and what other companies around the world are trying, yeah, you can reuse that. But wouldn't it be a lot easier to reuse something that looks like a donut that cannot fall in its side, that just uh, lands uh, and has a uh, uh, hundred times less uh, punishment from the heat re-entry than something uh, thin and slender? I said a hundred is probably more like a thousand times. So yeah, there's a, there are lots of advantages in this, and the fact that they haven't really been developed historically is because uh, nuclear weapons have been very heavy. So this wouldn't be a good vector to project uh, this kind of uh, threat. But if what you want to do is uh, put up cameras to prevent fires or to uh, better monitor uh, the seas or aviation or what have you, then, then we, we're in business. Well, the time is up. Uh, I, I, I'm very interested in this whole set of projects. I, I watched them Thank closely you. since two years ago. I watched your project and I read your articles, your scientific papers you published. They educated me about this whole topic. I will be watching closely your pro progress and uh, the progress of the whole industry because I want to be on one of those flights. It will happen. It's just a matter of when, not if.
Thank you, Jose. Thank you for your time. I really appreciate it. I, I hope to come back to you in my season two with a more in-depth uh, details on your project. Hopefully by then you'll be certifying your, your project and launching soon. Yeah, looking forward to that. This was the story about high altitude balloons. There are several companies which are planning to do that. In addition to Zero to Infinity, uh, and Jose just told us about his plans, there are two companies in US, Worldview and Space Perspective. There are two companies in France, Zephalto and Stratoflight. There is one company in Japan, and there are some other companies elsewhere in the world. All of them are planning to launch these projects next year or one or two years later. You can find more information about these projects at IDEA Space Travel website, idea.space. This podcast episode is available on YouTube and all podcast platforms like Spotify, Google Podcast, Amazon Music, and many more. Thank you and goodbye.